am, somebody has the best job in the whole wide world. I'm a police officer in the city of Grand Rapids, and maybe some of you will be too. And I've been doing this public safety business for a long time. I started when I was 18 years old in this field of public safety, police and fire. An awful lot of hours in a squad car. And you know, you're driving around at night in a squad car, you have lots of time to think. One of the things I thought about is, where did this whole idea of policing come from? And what's this business about community-oriented policing? I mean, think about it. You hear the term community-oriented policing, sounds rather ridiculous. It's like saying fish-oriented fishing. Or clothes-oriented shopping. If the police aren't oriented towards the community, then who are we oriented towards? ourselves. So the term doesn't make a lot of sense. But in order for you to understand community-oriented policing and what's next, and that is collaborative-oriented policing, and why community-oriented policing isn't a good description of the way policing is done in the United States, and maybe it's never been done in the United States, I have to give you a history of the four models of policing. I stand here before you wearing a badge, some blue clothing, patches, where did this concept of policing come from? Well, it actually came from London, England in 1829. There was a man by the name of Sir Robert Peel, and Sir Robert Peel was the first police chief in, in London, England. This is a picture of a London police officer nicknamed a Bobby after Robert Peel. Peel said something he's kind of noted for, and that is police are the people, and the people are the police. And really, the only difference between the police and the people are the police are people or citizens that are being paid to devote their full-time attention to what is really the responsibility of every citizen. Think about that. That means the police can't do it alone. So that's where our model of policing came from, the Peel model in London, England in 1829. It's a little bit before Grand Rapids started the police department in 1891. And by the time the Civil War came along, most of the major cities in the United States had some sort of uh, police department. The problem is it was a little bit different than Peel's model in that the police departments were actually run by politicians. The police chiefs were figureheads. There was graft, there was corruption. If you don't believe that, research the history of the St. Paul Police Department. You'll find that gangsters out of Chicago, when the heat got to be too hot, they were going to be arrested. They'd flee to St. Paul, and there was an unwritten agreement they wouldn't be arrested in St. Paul. There's even rumors going around that some of them even had hideouts up, up here in Itasca County. So a lot of graft, a lot of corruption, and this model went until about the early 1930s. The early 1930s, we see the automobile, police officers being placed on automobiles. We see the application of science to help solve legal problems or solve crimes. The time the FBI was organized. The time fingerprints started being used to help solve crimes. Corruption went by the bye-bye. This is called the reform model of policing. It probably hit its heyday in about the 1960s. And if you would have been around in the 1960s, one of the most popular television programs was... Dragnet, just the facts, man. Impartial, impersonal, no relationship with the community at all. Didn't work all that well. Thanks for your input. Now here's what we're going to do. The police telling the community, here's what you really need for policing, and here's the way you're going to be police. No input from the community whatsoever. 1970s, 1980s. We go away from the reform model of policing, and we haven't quite found a, a new model of policing. We see things such as crime prevention programs in which there's a realization that maybe citizens are part of this. Maybe citizens can manage their own risk of being the victim of a crime. We see such things as problem-oriented policing, police community relations units, None of them are really models of still the reform model of policing until 1994. Community-oriented policing was a term that was coined. It was coined by then President Bill Clinton, who was a Democrat, and the Republicans attacked the Democrats, saying, you're too soft on crime. So he decided, well, we're going to coin this new term called community-oriented policing. We're going to get federal money, and they did $10 billion, and we're going to put 100,000 new cops on the street. You want crime to go up? Place more cops out on the street. You got more eyes and ears to detect stuff. Actually, crime did go down a little bit. 
The social scientists will tell you it had a lot to do with a lot of other things, such as improving co economy. But community-oriented policing is a philosophy, and the philosophy is that it focuses primarily on problems first, relationships second. And the idea is a police officer will work with citizens in the community to identify with both groups, the police and the citizens believe to be problems, and then bring government resources to bear on the problem to solve the problem. But here's the problem. Police aren't good at solving problems. We can't solve drug abuse, which drives much of the crimes that we're called upon to deal with. You know, the number one thefts we have in the city of Grand Rapids, Walmart, shoplifting. Guess what they're doing? They're supporting a drug habit. The police can't solve that. It takes the whole community to solve that. This is the way policing has been done across the United States for many years. Those other models, forget them. What police are really good at is forming relationships. Relationships with the public, one at a time. Continuously doing that. And then we're awful at solving crime ourselves. You know what we're good at doing? We mine those relationships for information. What do you know about this? What do you know about that? Putting together the information, and that's how crime is solved. Police can't solve crime by ourselves. If community-oriented policing isn't a very good description of how policing is actually done, what is? It's, it's what I like to call collaborative policing. It's the way it's been, policing's been done for, for many years across Minnesota and across this country. Some of the elements. First, you have to have a culture. A culture of reaching out to the community, a culture of being open, a culture of being transparent, a culture of caring, a culture of knowing you can't do it by yourself, asking for help from, from the people in, 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 the, uh, in the community. A culture in which patrol officers, every time they make a vehicle stop or have contact with somebody, is selling the department. A culture in which your police administrator is marketing the department through the media. That's why just about every single week you'll see something positive in our local newspaper about the Grand Rapids Police Department. Listen, the City Council approved this last year a police community advisory board in which a group of citizens on this board get together every other month. And they tell us how we're doing as a, as a police department. They tell us, hey, you know, body cameras, uh, these programs, those programs, you know, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. We need to hear that. We're part of the community, not a part of, from the community. Ethics, very important. Seeing the whole picture, not, try, not being afraid to experiment, innovation. Humor. Man, I've been in some police departments. You walk through the door, you can hear a pin drop. Those police departments have got problems. Cops have got some of the best sense of humor you ever wanted to see, despite what the way we're painted on television. Being a part of the community, compassion. We want to hire police officers that have compassion for their fellow, fellow human being. We want to hire police officers that have a philosophy of there but for the grace of God go I. We want to hire police officers that understand that God loves that person you're dealing with in the most difficult situation has done the most awful thing, loves that individual as much as he loves you and me. That's what we're looking for. Programs. Certainly programs are part of this, reaching out. You know, up in the upper right-hand corner, we've got some patrol officers in a gymnasium, and they're dancing in tutus. I'm not really sure what that's about, but it must be part of collaborative policing. You know, we've got the D.A.R.E. program and, uh, you know, the, the Polar Plunge. And, but maybe what I should do is just give you some examples of what it is I'm talking about. One day I find out that one of our officers goes every morning for coffee at the local coffee shop. And it's one of those coffee shops where you stand in line at the counter and you, you get the coffee. Turns out she's been buying coffee for the person behind her, whoever that stranger is, and not telling anybody. 
That's, that's uh, building relationships one at a time. Man comes in the station, says, Chief, I'm going out of the country, going to a foreign country, you know, and uh, we're just having coffee, just discussing it. He walks out with a letter from me saying, this individual is a fine, outstanding uh, member of our community. And if you're a police officer, you come across them in, in your country, don't be afraid to call me at home. Here's my home phone number in case you should get into some trouble. Uh, we, we, we had an incident in which uh, there was a burglary. A burglary occurred at a residence in which two, two coffee cans of quarters were taken. We reached out to the Chamber of Commerce. Somebody's going to be cashing in these quarters or buying something with them. Within a day, they had gotten the word out to everybody that belonged to the chamber. We got a phone call from a local bank. Guess what? The guy came in, tried to open up an account with the quarters. They let him open up the account, have a picture of his driver's license, and he was going to come in in another 20 minutes. We arrested him. Collaborative policing is very, very effective. Building relationships. I'll tell you one way that relationships are built. There, one winter afternoon, officers respond to a call of a heart attack. Man was out shoveling his, his walk, had a heart attack, massive heart attack. We get there, do the first aid. His wife is the one that called. She's going with the ambulance. You know, they're taking the man to the emergency room. Guess what one of the officers did? The officer picked up a shovel and finished shoveling the man's sidewalk. Compassion, relationship. That's what collaborative policing is all about. If you think you might want to be a peace officer and practice this type of policing, come talk to us after you get your four-year degree. Thank you.